This video is an introduction to the histology and clinical features of keratinocyte skin cancers, which include basal cell carcinoma, BCC, and squamous cell carcinoma, SCC. The goal of this video is to make histological clinical correlations for squamous cell carcinoma and basal cell carcinoma. And to do this, we're going to start off by describing what these lesions look like histologically, and then link that directly to what these lesions look like clinically. So let's go ahead and do that first for squamous cell carcinoma, and then we'll do the same for basal cell carcinoma. So to start us off, I wanted to start off with a cartoon image of what this cancer looks like histologically. And before we describe the details, just to orient you, this darker tan color here at the top with all of these cells represents the epidermis and then below it in this lighter tan color is the underlying dermis and these blue and red circular structures are meant to indicate blood vessels. And you can probably see in the middle of this image is where kind of the real abnormality is and this represents the squamous cell carcinoma. But before we describe that I wanted to kind of draw your attention to a normal span of epidermis here at the left. Because I think by describing what normal is, we can have a better appreciation for what abnormal is. So notice here we have an orderly progression from the bottom of the epidermis, which is the basal cell layer, all the way up to the top of the epidermis, the stratum corneum at the top. And this is in direct contrast to what is going on in the center of this image. And specifically, there are four features that I want to call your attention to in this image that distinguish this lesion as an invasive squamous cell carcinoma. So the first thing to note is notice how these keratinocytes are all different shapes and sizes. Some are big, some are small, and their nuclei are also all different sizes and shapes. The cellular irregularity and variation in the size of the nuclei is referred to broadly as pleomorphism. So this is one hallmark feature of a squamous cell carcinoma. A second feature to be aware of is notice in the center that there are simply too many of these keratinocytes. Essentially what we have is diffuse hyperplasia of the epidermis. And histologically, this is often referred to as acanthosis. And one thing to note about acanthosis is that it's always relative to where you are in the body. So for example, the epidermis on top of your eyelid is very thin, but the epidermis in the palms and soles of your hands and your feet are much thicker. And so what might be a normal thickness in one part of the body might be an abnormal thickness of epidermis in another part of the body. So it's always important to know that it's relative. But in this case, relative to the normal span of epidermis we highlighted, there's clear hyperplasia or acanthosis in the middle of the image. Now it turns out that the hyperplasia that occurs in the uppermost part of the epidermis, mostly in the stratum corneum, is also given a special name. Specifically, it's referred to as hyper keratosis, which is just a fancy way of saying that there's hyperplasia of the keratin-filled cells up at the top. A third feature to call your attention to is notice here at the bottom we have clusters of atypical keratinocytes that have invaded into the underlying dermis. And this is a hallmark feature of invasive squamous cell carcinoma. And invasive simply refers to the fact that these atypical cancerous keratinocytes have invaded past the basement membrane which underlies the bottom of the epidermis into the underlying dermis. Notably, it's this feature of invasion past the basement membrane into the underlying dermis that makes invasive squamous cell carcinoma distinct from another similar lesion called squamous cell carcinoma in situ. Squamous cell carcinoma in situ is what is often referred to as an intraepithelial neoplasm. In other words, a neoplasm that's confined to the epidermis. So just to kind of summarize all of this, essentially in a squamous cell carcinoma in situ, you would see many of the features we talked about earlier, like the pleomorphism, acanthosis, maybe even a little bit of hyperkeratosis, but you would not see invasion past this basement membrane into the dermis as we see with invasive squamous cell carcinoma. And now finally, the last feature that I just want to call your attention to is notice how there are these speckled dots drawn in the dermis around these blood vessels. And these are just meant to represent a infiltrate of inflammatory cells, with the idea being that the body is trying to mount an immune response against the atypical cancerous keratinocytes. And in fact, this is a common theme that you'll see for many of the skin cancers that we'll talk about, which is there's often an inflammatory infiltrate of cells associated with these lesions histologically.
So now that we've used this cartoon image to build a framework of understanding, the next step is to look at an actual hematoxin and eosin stain or h &E stain of a squamous cell carcinoma. So here is a 2D histological slice of a squamous cell carcinoma. And just to orient you, up here at the top in this dark pink stain is the stratum corneum, which if you recall mostly consists of keratin and is the uppermost layer of the epidermis. And then directly underlying it, these cells here in lighter purple represent the remainder of the epidermis. And the first thing that might strike you is that you can notice that there is wide variation in the overall thickness of the epidermis. And essentially, what we're seeing here are areas of acanthosis. So notice here we have diffuse hyperplasia of the epidermis. Normally, the epidermis should be a much smaller thickness, maybe something like this but instead we're seeing some clear diffuse hyperplasia or acanthosis. In addition, we're also seeing some hyperplasia of this stratum corneum layer, and this was what we gave the name hyperkeratosis to in the cartoon image. Now, admittedly, it's a little bit harder to appreciate the pleomorphism or cellular irregularity in the epidermis since we're a little bit more zoomed out here than we were on the cartoon image. But one feature that should be readily apparent to you is that you can notice that there are clusters of atypical keratinocytes that have invaded into the underlying dermis, which is the hallmark of this being an invasive squamous cell carcinoma. And in addition, the hazy blue sea of cells that we mostly see in the dermis, so I'll circle kind of a cluster of cells here. So these hazy blue cells, which are a little bit hard to see, but are diffusely located in the dermis, represent an inflammatory infiltrate of cells that we saw in the cartoon image as well. And then finally, something that's probably staring you in the face, but that we actually did not talk about in the cartoon image, are these hyper eosinophilic clumps in the center of the image. So what might these be? So I'll remind you that eosin, one of the dyes in the H&E stain, is a acidic dye, it's a red acidic dye that stains basic structures such as proteins. And remember that keratin is a protein. And in fact, these hyper eosinophilic clumps, which stain bright red, are essentially staining keratin that's being produced by atypical keratinocyte cells in the squamous cell carcinoma. And histologically, they're often referred to as something called keratin pearls. And they can be a useful diagnostic marker when diagnosing squamous cell carcinoma histologically. All right, so with that histological overview, the next step is to take a look at what the squamous cell carcinoma looks like clinically. So here is an image of a squamous cell carcinoma. But before we describe the lesion, I just wanted to point out that the surrounding skin in this individual is rather atrophic, rather thin, and even hyperpigmented in some areas as I'm indicating here, and all of this can be a sign of chronic sun damage, which notably is one of the most important risk factors for the development of a skin cancer. And so already this clues us into the fact that the lesion we are seeing here may very well be a skin cancer. And so how might we describe this skin lesion? I might go ahead and describe this as a scaly papule with surrounding redness or erythema. Now the first question to ponder might be what accounts for the accumulation of all of this scale on the top of the lesion? And to answer this, let's return to what we saw histologically. So remember that we noted there was hyperplasia of the stratum corneum, which we referred to as hyperkeratosis. And all of this accumulation of keratin essentially is what accounts for the appearance of all of this scale on the top of the lesion. So that's kind of a neat histological clinical correlation to make for this lesion. Another thing to note about this lesion is that there are areas that look a little bit more friable than other areas, maybe like here and here and here. And what accounts for this kind of friability is thinning of the epidermis in some regions. So if you remember back to our histology, there was wide variation in the thickness of the epidermis. So in some areas, we had very thin spans of epidermis, and then in other areas, we had much thicker 
bands of epidermis or the acanthosis and so these areas of thinner epidermis is where you can see some friability and sometimes in poorly differentiated squamous cell carcinomas you can even have erosions or ulcerations which can expose the underlying dermis and make the lesion look even more friable and finally the last histological clinical correlation I want to make for this lesion is with regard to why we see this redness or erythema associated with the lesion. And this goes back to what we saw again histologically, this time with regard to the inflammatory cells that we noted alongside the lesion histologically, largely in the dermis. And it's these inflammatory cells that can mediate the processes of inflammation. So for example, leading to dilation of blood vessels and therefore the appearance of erythema or redness at the skin surface, which we see clinically in the lesion. All right, so that sums up our histological clinical correlations for squamous cell carcinoma. And now let's go ahead and do the same exact thing for basal cell carcinoma. And this time it's gonna go a little bit faster now that we have our thought process all mapped out. So once again, let's go ahead and start off with a cartoon image of a basal cell carcinoma. Notice that we again have hyperplasia of the epidermis, but this time the hyperplasia that we're seeing is due to the proliferation primarily of this basal cell layer of the epidermis here at the bottom. And I want to take a minute to talk about why the cartoon is illustrating the cells in this way. So the first thing is the reason why the basal cell layer cells have very prominent nuclei is because as stem cells, these cells are capable of self-renewal and the daughter cells go on to differentiate through the various layers of the epidermis until of course they become the stratum corneum up at the top. And as they differentiate toward the top of the epidermis, the nuclei get much smaller until they essentially almost entirely disappear and the cell is filled with keratin. So that's why the cells at the bottom in the basal cell layer have the most prominent nuclei of all of the layers in the epidermis. And the second point to make is that the reason this cartoon is highlighting these cells as having kind of prominent blue nuclei is because remember that the hematoxylin dye in the H&E stain is a basic blue dye that stains acidic structures like RNA and DNA found in the nucleus. And so that's why the blue hematoxylin dye is visualized primarily in the nucleus of cells and why we see this kind of vibrant purplish blue color of this layer of cells. And then finally, I also want to note this cluster or nest of basaloid cells here which has invaded into the underlying dermis, signifying that this is an invasive basal cell carcinoma. All right, so now let's go ahead and take a look at the actual H&E stain. So here's a 2D histological slice of a basal cell carcinoma. And once again, just to orient you, up here at the top in this very dark pink color is the epidermis. And then below it in this lighter pink color is the underlying dermis. And I want to call your attention to these basaloid nests that we're seeing in the dermis, just as we saw in the cartoon image. So I'll go ahead and circle a couple of small ones here. You can see a little bit of a bigger one down here at the bottom. And then of course, this large, well demarcated nest of cells in the dermis here. And notice that these cells have very prominent blue nuclei, cluing us into the fact these are basaloid cells, which in this case are proliferating atypically in these basaloid clusters within the underlying dermis. Now it turns out there are a couple more histological features that can be useful diagnostic clues when diagnosing basal cell carcinoma. So the first thing is something called a retraction artifact, and that refers to this white gap between the basaloid nest and the surrounding dermis. So that white gap is due to, as the name implies, an artifact that's produced when the slide is being prepared and stained. And essentially what happens is, is that the dermis around the basaloid nest just retracts a little bit, creating this white gap. And so the important point to emphasize here is that the retraction artifact is not due to the cancerous cells themselves, but rather an artifact of the staining process. And the second thing that can be a useful diagnostic marker is the phenomenon that's known as peripheral palisading. And this phenomenon describes the fact that cells on the periphery of these basaloid nests tend to be arranged in a very linear way. And so as I'm circling, circling here, you can see that the 
basal cells are just lining up in a very neat formation, essentially tightly enclosing the cells within them away from the surrounding dermis. So this is a phenomenon, once again, called peripheral palisading, and it's a term that pathologists might use when they're describing a basal cell carcinoma. All right, so now I think we're ready to see what this lesion looks like clinically. So here is an image of a basal cell carcinoma, and specifically, this is a nodular basal cell carcinoma. And it's important to note that there are several subtypes of basal cell carcinoma, but nodular is the most common, and so we're gonna focus on that subtype. And I just wanna point out that these four black dots around the lesion here were marked on the patient by the dermatologist just to highlight the lesion, but we'll go ahead and ignore these spots um, as we describe the lesion. So how might we describe this lesion? I would go ahead and describe this as a papule, specifically a papule with a shiny, almost translucent surface and a central indentation within which looks like there might be an erosion or ulceration. And then on the outside, notice the borders are really smooth and almost rolled like a donut. And then it's a little bit harder to see this, but there's also a dilated blood vessel on the surface of the lesion. I'll go ahead and circle it right here. And this has a special name. It's called a telangiectasia. And it is often found on these basal cell carcinomas, which tend to be very vascular cancers. And it's hard to see if there's a blood vessel on this histology stain, um, it's possible that this up here is a blood vessel, but hard to say if that's what we would actually be seeing on the lesion itself. But suffice to say, a telangiectasia is a hallmark feature of many nodular basal cell carcinomas. One important histological clinical correlation to make for this lesion is actually what's not there, at least compared to what we saw for the squamous cell carcinoma. So if you remember for the squamous cell carcinoma, we saw that the lesion had a lot of scale, but this time we're not seeing much scale. So why is that? So if you remember, going back to the histology, remember we didn't see much epidermal change. Rather, most of the pathology was in the dermis where we had accumulation of these basaloid nests. And so because we don't have a lot of epidermal change, we don't see a lot of scale. On the other hand, this kind of raised papular, almost nodular appearance is due to the accumulation of these basaloid nests within the dermis. Now over time what can happen is as these cancerous cells continue to grow and proliferate, they can actually outgrow their blood supply and in doing so necrosis or cell death can ensue. And in part that is reflected in what's going on in the center of this lesion, this erosion um, in the center of the lesion can represent the necrosis that's occurring as the cells outgrow their blood supply. This central erosion or ulceration is commonly referred to as a rodent-like ulcer because it is supposed to look as if a rodent, like a rat, took a bite essentially out of the center of the lesion. So that's a fun fact that you can take away from this video. So that wraps up our discussion of the histological clinical correlations for basal cell carcinoma. And now at the end of the video, I hope you now have a greater appreciation for why keratinocyte carcinomas look the way they do based on what we see going on in histology.